haven't turned over there yet. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter 3 is kind of where we're going to start today. And you say, well, Brother Don, if we're in Joel, why are we starting in 2 Peter chapter 3? And the reason is, is that everything in the New Testament has its point in fact and its point of origin uh, in the Old Testament. So if you're going to understand a lot of the things that are in the New Testament, especially as it relates to prophecy, you have to understand the Old Testament. So we couldn't understand if it was not for the Old Testament prophets that we've been studying, we couldn't understand here what Peter is talking about beginning in verse 4 and going through verse 18. And we're going to read this together. Please stand up as we read Second uh, Peter chapter 3, verse 4 through 18 together. One thing that uh, you younger guys will be excited about is uh, that uh, Brian uses the Bible, but he uses an electronic Bible and he uses an electronic, uh, so you know, you guys would, would be zooming into the 21st century, uh, you know, with Brian and me, i am still got a Bible and I got paper and you know, whatever. So uh, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4, through 18. If you're ready, say amen. All right, here we go. <clears throat> and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, that heavens, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the word that then was being overflowed with world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved uh, for against the uh, reserved under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing: that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And you'll need that, that's from Psalm, uh, Psalm 90, but you'll need that in understanding some of the verses we're going to look at today. Uh, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. <clears throat> but the day of the Lord, and circle that, will come as a thief in the night, in which the heaven shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are in it shall be burned up. And this is found in multiple places in the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy living and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. Now that's not found anywhere in the Bible except right here in which the heavens being on fire should be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for a new heavens and a new earth in which dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace uh, without spot and blameless. And an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and, and uh, unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye brethren, beloved, seeing that you know these things, therefore beware, lest you also be uh, being led away uh, with the error of wickedness, fall from your own steadfastness, fastness, but grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Lord Jesus, I pray today that You'll let us understand Your Word. I pray that Your Word will motivate all of us to be closer to You. Uh, your Word will motivate us to be doing what You have commissioned us to do, reaching the world with the Gospel. Lord, I pray that you would impress upon all of our hearts today that uh, the day of the Lord, the last days are wrapping up rapidly and uh, that we have great responsibility as your church to reach a lost 
and dying world. We love you, Lord, and we praise your holy name. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you very much. Be seated. And now, if you would, turn over to uh, the book of Joel. Uh, now, the, the book of Joel, Joel's name means the Lord Jehovah is God. The Lord Jehovah is God. There is only one God, and His name is Yahweh or Jehovah, but that one God exists as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That is not revealed to us necessarily in the Old Testament, but it is revealed to us in the New Testament when Jesus commanded that we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We can see that Father, Son, Holy Spirit and everything in Scripture because even in the book of Genesis during the creation story, in the beginning God, you know, Elohim, plural for God, uh, created the heavens and the earth and then the Spirit was above the waters and man was created in God's image, meaning the image of God is Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 8. So, Jehovah, the Lord, is God. Let's all say that. Jehovah, the Lord, is God. Now, there are basically the theme of this book and the theme of most of the books that we're going to study till the end of the Old Testament here is the theme is the day of the Lord. Everybody say that. The day of the Lord. Now, there are three days in the Bible that you have to understand what they mean. You say, well, Brother Don, why is that important to me as a Christian? I mean, you know, I want to have a good marriage. I want this and that and the other. I want to have this and that. And, and I need to know how to apply things. You need to know that there are three days. And here's the reason why. The main day right now that we're in is the day of the Lord. Everybody say the day of the Lord. When did the day of the Lord begin? The day of the Lord began with Christ's first advent to the earth. When does the day of the Lord end? When Christ judges the living and the dead at the white throne judgment. When it, and from that point it issues in, issues in like we read in 2 Peter chapter 3, new heavens, new earth, and a new relationship with God. Revelation chapter 21 and 22. So the day of the Lord began when Jesus came to the earth the first time. It continues through this very day and will continue through the second coming of Christ, through the kingdom age uh, that's mentioned in the Bible, all the way to the great white throne judgment that's in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Now inside of this day of the Lord, the day of the Lord is a great big thing. But inside that day of the Lord, there's another day that relates just to me and you. And just to Christians. And that's called the Day of Christ. Everybody say Day of Christ. That's found six different places in the New Testament. And uh, Paul, the most famous one, is over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, verse 23, that Paul says, I pray that uh, your body, soul, and spirit will be held harmless until the Day of Christ. Christ. What is the day of Christ? That relates only to the church. The day of Christ refers only to the church. It has nothing to do with Israel. The day of the Lord, all about Israel. The day of Christ, all about the church. Now, the day of Christ is one particular day. And that day is when Jesus removes His church from the earth. Now, is that just one event? Maybe. Or is that multiple events as recorded in Revelation? Maybe. We don't know that, but we do know that the day of Christ is when Christ calls His entire church to Him and He judges His church. So the day of Christ relates only to the church. The day of Christ will precede the second coming of Christ to save Israel. So see, in the Bible, it's very important that you separate out those things that deal with Israel and you separate out those things that deal with the church. The day of the Lord, like I said, all about Israel. The day of Christ, all about the church. The day of Christ has not yet occurred. That's what Second Thessalonians, the book of 2 Thessalonians is all about. Even though they saw a lot of bad things in the world and the Roman Empire was persecuting the church and all kinds of awful things were happening, Paul said, don't be ignorant. The day of Christ has not yet come. And so you need to know day of the Lord and day of Christ. But then there's a third day, and we just read about it, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. And that's the day of what? God. So we got day of the Lord, day of Christ, 
day of God. What is the day of God? Well, it says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 <laughs> that Jesus has to ful fulfill all things until the Lord can be one again. So see, Jesus being the image of God is the sacrifice of God, is the Lamb of God, is the line of the tribe of Judah. And through Jesus, God is restoring all things in His relationship between Himself and man. All that's being done through Jesus. But once that restoration is complete, once the earth is restored, once our regular relationship with Jesus is restored, once all of that stuff is restored, then what happens is we enter into the period of time that we're going to spend eternity in, in the new heaven and the new earth, and that's called the day of God. And there is no end to that day. That day begins and there is no end. So you got day of the Lord, primarily Israel. you got day of Christ, only the church. And you got day of God for everybody that makes it into the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. So now, if you can keep those straight in the Bible, then you will better understand, when you're reading in prophecy especially, you'll better understand what's been going on. When did Joel write this letter? Sometime between the 9th and 8th century B.C. Nobody knows for sure because he didn't list any kings like some of the other prophets had done. He, he didn't list any kings. This is before, though, 726 B.C. because that's when the Assyrians conquered Israel. And so we know it's before then because that had, hasn't happened yet. There are four major truths in the book of Joel. The first truth is this. We read about that in a minute. We see the desolation of the locusts. Israel, because of its great sin, is going to lose everything. And it really probably, it really already has. Remember, Israel was supposed to be a pleasant land, a fruitful land, a prosperous land. The people were going to live in peace and prosperity forever and ever and ever. But because they sinned against God, because they committed idolatry against God, because they broke God's heart, God carried them away, the northern tribes with the Assyrians and the southern tribes with the Babylonians and then again with the Romans. And so they have suffered total destruction uh, over a period of about uh, 2,700 years as a result of their sin. So that's the first point it makes. The second point it makes, though, is that in this point, is in both of these points are in almost every one of these minor prophets. If Israel will repent, God will deliver them. Now, let's, let's think about this for a minute. How many of y'all have ever been to Israel? Okay. When you go to Israel, you see a lot of very zealous people, especially if you go to the Wailing Wall. You see a lot of very zealous people. If you go to David's tomb, there's people there reading the law and the prophets uh, and the Psalms all the time. But then if you start meeting some of the people, a lot of the people are Jews but a lot of them don't even believe in God. So what you have in Israel, you have a nation that has been reborn, but the people as a nation don't yet follow God like God wants them to. Does that make sense? And that's really the same situation they were in before the Assyrians conquered them, before the Babylonians conquered them. In order for them to be completely delivered, in order for them to receive the promises of God, they're going to have to repent and even though it doesn't spell out in the book of Joel what that repentance looks like, we're going to learn when we get to the book of Zechariah that they've got to repent and that repentance looks like this. They've got to look upon him, it says Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10, they've got to look upon him whom they pierced, it says, and they've got to claim him for their Messiah. In other words, their repentance in order for God to deliver them, in order for them to receive the promises of God, They've got to repent by accepting Jesus as their Messiah. And that has not happened yet. And they do that as a nation. Alright, then God has promised that once they repent, that He will return and destroy the nations of the world that have come against Israel. There's going to come a day when all the nations on earth are going to hate Israel. And a large contingent of nations are going to come against Israel in, in Israel. Uh, for the one purpose and that's to obliterate the Jews from the earth because they're going to be convinced that all their problems on earth see here's what's going to happen it, the first half of the tribulation you're going to have all of these 
uh, plagues, you're going to have all of this death, you're going to have all of this drought, you're going to have all of these things. And it's all going to be tied to these two Jewish witnesses in Jerusalem. Even though it's happening in heaven, even though Jesus is bringing it about to happen and he's, he's trying to chastise the earth so they'll turn to him, the world's going to think it's these two Jewish prophets. And that's what they're going to see. And so they're going to blame Israel for all of the bad things happening in the world. And so an army of 200 million plus men, more than that, because that's just 200 million coming from China, there's an army of over 200 million men are going to come against Israel to destroy it. But if Israel will repent and accept Jesus as Messiah, then Jesus will come at the second coming of Christ for one purpose, and that's to save the Jews from the nations of the world. See, a lot of Christians misunderstand this. They think the second coming of Christ is when He comes and saves the church. That's not true. The day of Christ is when Jesus takes us out of the earth, and that's how He saves us. The second coming of Christ is all about the Jews, 100%. has nothing to do with the church, except it's probable that all those uh, saints that are with Jesus at the second coming riding horses with white linen robes, that's probably us. So, you know, a really good idea is that you guys really uh, get out there on the weekends and learn how to ride horses if you don't already know. So you're ready to go at the second coming of Christ. So the second coming of Christ has nothing to do with us. It's all about the Jews. And the Jews, in order for Jesus to come at the second coming to save them, have to repent. And then the next, the next thing that happens, and we'll read about here in just a minute in Joel, is that Jesus promises that when He returned, after He's gone and after He returns, that He would pour out His Spirit on all flesh. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. And then uh, God promises in the book of Joel that once the Lord has returned and set up His kingdom on this earth, that there'll be His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and will last forever and ever and ever. And indeed it will. So all of that is found in the book of Joel. And a lot of that is found in most of the next books that we're going to study. So if we're just kind of getting warmed up, if you're ready to start, say amen. amen. So let's see where we've been so far so that you understand why we're studying through the Bible and what we've seen. <clears throat> Turn over, if you would, to Ezekiel 36. We've already studied this. Uh, we studied this a ways back. I don't know how far back, but a ways back. Ezekiel chapter 36. Now, beginning in Ezekiel 36, in Ezekiel 36, uh, this is the restoration of Israel to the land. This probably occurred in 1948. But that nation appeared as a nation of what? Dry bones. And then God breathed His Spirit into those dry bones and they came alive, which means the nation Israel uh, came alive. And then in Ezekiel 36, you've got a parallel passage here where God promises that after Israel returns as a nation and after Israel repents, that He will give them a new spirit. He will place a new spirit in them. Now listen to me. If you're listening, say Amen. Now, we don't have to wait for that day. Because everybody in here who's in Jesus, we've already received God's Holy Spirit. We already have a new soul in us. We already have God's Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We're already participants in this new covenant that is promised to Israel, but which they have not yet received. Then you go over here to uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39. And when we talk about all the nations coming against Israel, seeking to destroy them. Here in Ezekiel 38 and 39, you get a lot of the details uh, that, it, that, that the nations coming against Israel are going to be Gog and Magog and Mesech and going to be Persia and Cush, which is Ethiopia, and Put, which is Libya, Gomer, which is uh, Greece, uh, Togomar, which is where uh, Turkey is today, etc., etc., etc. A lot of the details. Then you go on over and you see where uh, there's going to be a new temple in the new kingdom, and you learn all that in the book of Ezekiel. Then you come over to where we studied last week, or we go to, go to the book of Daniel, sorry. And in the book of Daniel, we studied about the 70, 70 weeks of Daniel. Who, ever, who remembers us studying that? If you remember studying that, that was just two weeks ago. The book of Daniel, he has his 70-week prophecy. 70 weeks or seven years. The first 69 weeks lead up to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. 
But the 70th week happens sometimes later. In fact, there's a period of time between the 69th week of Daniel and the 70th week of Daniel. Now remember, the day of the Lord began with the first advent of Christ. The first advent of Christ ended in Acts chapter 1 verse 10 when Jesus went to heaven. Okay, right now we're in the church age. Everybody say church age. It's also called the age of the Spirit. And it's been going on for a while. But there's a period of time between the 69th week and 70th week. That was not explained in the Old Testament. We know that's true today because we know the 70th week has not occurred. The 70th week will be seven years long. And that will be the period of time that we know is the tribulation. And we know there will be an antichrist during that period of time. And we'll know the Messiah who was crucified for the sins of the people will come at the consummation, the second coming, and destroy the Antichrist and set up his kingdom on this earth. We know that from the book of Daniel. Go over to the book of Hosea, where we were last week. We didn't study this last week in Hosea. But if you look at Hosea chapter 5, verse 14, I want to read you a couple of verses. And this is God speaking in first person. Hosea chapter 5, verse 14. For I will be unto Ephraim like a lion, and like a young lion to the house of Judah, I, even I, will tear and go away. I will take away and none shall rescue him. I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction they will seek me early. Come and let us return unto the Lord. For he has torn, but he will heal us. He has smitten, but he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. And the third day he will raise up and we shall live in his sight. In 2 Peter we read a while ago, a day in the life of the Lord is how many human days? How many? How many? A thousand. Exactly. So if the Lord's going to return to his place, which it says here that he is, this is return, referring to his first advent, it says that he'll return after two days. And two days in the life of the Lord is how many years? 2,000 years. So now, from the book of Hosea, we can put that together of Daniel. We see there's going to be approximately 2,000 years between the 69th week of Daniel and the 70th week of Daniel. We see there's going to be about a 2,000-year two year period of time that is not explained in the Old Testament, but we know in the New Testament that that period of time is going to be the church age. And we know that because we studied in the book of of Hosea. What's interesting in a minute you're going to see the term the latter rain and the future rain. In fact you'll see that in several different places uh, in the Old Testament. The latter rain and the future rain. And what that means is is the latter rain is when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon all believers in Christ at Pentecost. That's the former rain. And then the rain that is to come, the future rain, that's the Holy Spirit that's going to be poured out upon the Jews when they accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. The former rain and the future rain. That's what that means. When you see rain in the Bible, uh, that means, always means spirit. All right, so let's take a look here at Joel. Now we're to Joel. Here in Joel chapter 1, verse 4, it says this, That which the palmer worm has left, the locust has eaten. And that which the locust left has the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm has left has the caterpillar eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up on my land stronger and without number, whose teeth are like the teeth of a lion. He has the cheeks of a, of a great lion. He has laid my vine, uh, my vine waste, and he has barked. Uh, my fig tree, he has made it completely bare and cast away. Its branches are made white. So the Lord <clears throat> says that he compares what has happened to Israel because of their sin to what locusts do to agriculture. Has anybody ever seen a swarm of locusts? Any of you see slickers? Well, we see it all the time in the Midwest. They'll come up and... and uh, Man, when they come up, they get on and in everything. It's just awful. And they come up periodically. And when they go through a field of corn or a field of wheat or a field of soybeans or whatever, they devour it. Now, what are this locust here that God is alluding to in the book of Joel? What's that all about? 
That's a picture of all the armies that are going to come against Israel and that God's going to allow the armies to be successful against Israel and God's going to allow those armies to destroy Israel. The first one was Assyria. The second one was Babylon. The third one was Persia. The fourth one was Greece. The fifth one is Rome. And then we've got what comes out of Rome in the future. And so those armies that come against Israel and that God allowed to destroy Israel are going to be like locusts. But then pick it, let's pick it up over here in Joel chapter 2, and verse 18, and it says, Then the Lord was jealous for His land, and He pitied His people. And the Lord answered and said unto His people, Behold, I will send you grain and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied with them. And I will no more make you a, pro a reproach among the nations, for I will remove far off from you the northern army, Remember Gog and Magog and those armies listed in uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39. And will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face towards the eastern sea and his rear towards the western sea and his stench shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do great things. So see, even the Lord has said, hey, the locust is going to destroy everything that you have if you will repent and turn to me, I will rescue you. That's what God promises Israel. I will rescue you, and I will restore your land. Now look down at uh, verse 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and colors of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and Jerusalem, uh, shall be delivered as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. For behold, in those days, and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley, it says in the King James, Jehoshaphat, but that means the valley of judgment, which is Armageddon actually. And I will judge them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, uh, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And they have cast lots for my people. Uh, and so in other words, they persecuted the Jews. And you pick it up up here in verse 9. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Uh, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Now over in Isaiah chapter 11, it says just the opposite. You're supposed to take your swords and beat them into plowshares, etc. because there's going to be peace in the kingdom age. But before the kingdom age, uh, God is uh, telling Israel, be ready to fight against the nations. Assemble yourselves and come all you nations and gather yourselves together round about. Uh, there cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the nations be wakened and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley of decision, or the valley of judgment. For there will I send to judge all the nations round about. Put in the sickle, uh, for the harvest is ripe. This is right out of Revelation chapter 14, verse 18. And come get down, for the press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, the stars shall withdraw their, their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion, the Lord himself shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of His people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall you know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall be no strangers pass through her anymore. So in other words, the Lord left the earth at the ascension. That's Jesus. The Lord is coming back at the second coming. When, and He's going to bring all the nations into the Valley of Decision, which is the Valley of Megiddo, which is Armageddon what it says over in Revelation chapter 16. And so there he's going to judge all the nations. And he's going to destroy everybody in that valley. And it tells you over in Ezekiel 39 that we were looking at a while ago that the blood in the entire valley, which is from the valley of Jezreel all the way down into the valley of Kidron, which is between Mount Zion and Jerusalem, will be filled to the, horse of, to the bridles of horses that deep in blood. Because all the people that are going to be destroyed in that valley. And it tells us in Ezekiel that it's going to take them seven months to clean up that mess. And they're just going to bury the people where they are. And that's really going to occur. That's really going to happen at the second coming of Jesus Christ.
And then God's going to, Jesus is going to judge all Israel out in the wilderness. We read that in Ezekiel 20. And then Jesus is going to judge all the Gentiles. The sheep will come into kingdom covenant. And the goats will be cast out. That's what it says over Matthew chapter 24. The judgment between the sheep and the goats. What it makes a sheep in the Gentile nations. Does that mean a sheep is a Christian? No. What it means is, is that the sheep are those people that uh, treated Israel nice during the tribulation period of time. And the goats are those people that hated Israel during the tribulation. So here's good advice to everybody, and especially to our country. Treat Israel nice. Because they are protected by the Lord. I don't care what anybody says. The most protected nation on earth is not the United States of America. The most protected nation on this earth is Israel. Yeah, Israel hadn't turned back to the Lord yet, but they're still the children of God. Amen? We are the adopted children of God. They are the natural children of God. So treat Israel nice. Now, so now the Lord has returned. He has now set up His kingdom on this earth. Where's the church during this period of time? Well, we don't have time to look at it, but over in Luke chapter 19, there's a parable where there's ten servants and they all get a dollar or all get a talent. And the guys that were faithful, they all get to rule over cities. So somehow or another, the church will be Christ's administrators over His kingdom, which is the entire earth. And He'll reign and rule from Jerusalem, from the throne of David. Uh, from Jerusalem, He'll be on this earth. Now it says here, that when the Lord returns in verse 27, Joel 2, 27, And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And then verse 28, And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Where have you heard that before? Where in the Bible have you heard that before, word for word? Huh? No, not Revelation. Where have you heard it? Is it the first sermon that... Huh? In Acts. It's in Acts chapter 2. It's Peter's sermon at Pentecost. Go over and look at that. Acts chapter 2. Let's talk about this for a minute. Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit has just been poured out upon the church. And everybody is confused and they even think that the guys that are speaking in tongues are drunk. They don't know what's going on. And so Peter stands up. Weak, wimpy Peter has now become a strong preaching Peter. Uh, because now he's got the Holy Spirit of God uh, in him. And so he begins to preach. And he here in verse 12, Acts chapter 2, verse 12. Acts chapter 2, verse 12. Sorry. Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 14. Let's pick it up there. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, uh, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. That would be nine o'clock in the morning. But this is that which was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heavens above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapory smoke. The sun shall be turned into to darkness, the moon into blood before that great and terrible day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I'm a little confused. So over here in Joel chapter 2, it talks about that the Spirit will be, be poured out upon Israel when the Lord returns. But here it says that in the last days the Lord will pour out His Spirit upon all men on the earth. So is there a confusion there? Is there a conflict there? No, there's not. Because the last days began with the ascension of Jesus Christ. And that's also the church age, which will be concluded by the day of what? Christ. And then that's part of the day of the Lord. So the last days, we're already in the last days. 
Now watch this. If you're, if you're listening, say amen. How do we know we're in the last days? Because God has already poured out His Holy Spirit upon His church. He hadn't poured His Holy Spirit out upon Israel yet because Israel hadn't repented and accepted Jesus as their Messiah. But that is going to occur just like it says here in the book of Joel, just like it says in the book of Zechariah, etc. But the last days began when we received, the church received the Holy Spirit. And for 2,000 years, this has been the age of the church, the age of the Spirit, because all Christians who believe in Jesus Christ, we've been born again. And being born again is not just going on a church road. Being born again is not just walking down the aisle. Being born again, that means that we've received the Holy Spirit of God who now dwells in our new rebirth soul that God has given us. And the only thing about us that's imperfect is our bodies. And those someday will be changed at the day of Christ. So the last days were there. When will, Brother Don, when will the day of Christ come? Don't know. But that's what we call the rapture of the church. Do we know what's gonna, when it's going to occur? No. Because a lot of you guys are just like me. You're procrastinators. Listen, in college, I'm a really good test taker. Okay? I can get up for the big day. I can't retain anything. I'm, I'm not like smart like Maurice. I just had to, I'd have to cram for tests. And I could get up for a test, an AC test. And the next day, I, would, I wouldn't remember anything that was on that test. And so if I knew I had a test coming up on Friday and it was like Monday, I probably would start studying about, I don't know how big the test is, but i start studying about Thursday. Anybody, can anybody identify that other than me? See, if we knew when the day of Christ was coming for sure, we'd piddle around and not do those things that we need to be doing because we got a little bit of time left. See, we don't know if we got any time left. And on top of that, how many of you know for sure that you'll make it to the end of the day alive? Nobody in this room. Now, I'm not trying to freak you out. I'm not trying to scare you. I don't want you to start having shortness of breath because you're having a panic attack because you might die today. But see, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've got to be prepared to go every day. You've got to be prayed up every day. You've got to have that tight relationship with Jesus every day. You've got to be prepared to go home every single day. Whether the rapture comes or whether death comes, you got to be ready to go. And Jesus wants all Christians, it says over in Matthew chapter 25, He wants all Christians set on ready. Now, are you set on ready? Are you, or have you got your Christian gear in park? See, a lot of Christians got their gear in park. Because I was talking to a guy one night at choir practice before I became a preacher. And... and um, me and another guy were talking about the rapture and he was in between us and finally he had heard just about enough and he was an older guy I'd known him all my life respected him he was a great guy great Christian he said I don't want to hear any more of this stuff about the rapture they've been predicting that for 2,000 years and it hadn't happened yet well see you can take that attitude if you want to you can take the attitude that the day of Christ the rapture of the church will never occur so therefore you can eat, drink and be merry and for today we die that's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. A lot of people back then had that attitude. Or you can assume when it says the Lord's going to come get us at the sound of the trumpet in the blink of an eye, you can take that for what it means that He could come and get us at any time. That means we have to be ready when? Now. And tomorrow we have to be ready now. And the next day we have to be ready now. We have to be ready every day for our Lord's return. Now you see, the day, of Christ, the day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ, they're going to have kind of a seven-year kickoff to that event. They're going to see all these events happening in the world, and some people are going to figure it out that, hey, the day of the Lord is coming. The day second coming of Christ is just seven years away. We've got to get ready. The church is not going to have that luxury. Jesus is going to come and get us. We're not going to know when, and we're gone. So we've got to be ready. John said over in 1 John that he labored so that he wouldn't be ashamed when he stood behind, before his Lord and Savior. I don't want to be ashamed. There's been a lot of times that I've been a weak, wimpy Christian. There's been a lot of times that I've been a really good Christian. But there's been just as many times that I've been a weak, wimpy Christian. And that bothers me a lot. Because I live up to the price to be paid for that. So I want to try every day to not be 
a weak, wimpy Christian. I want to be a pray that Christian. I want to be close to Christ. I want to hear His voice. I want to feel His Spirit. I want to be led by His Spirit. And that is the attitude we should all have. Because Jesus is going to say to His church, Come up here! But it's not going to be heard with human ears. It's going to be in the Spirit. And only those in the Spirit, meaning Christians, will they be able to hear that call. Now, I don't know if he's going to yell it or if it's going to be a whisper. Typically, God speaks in whispers like he spoke to uh, Elijah. So it may just be a whisper. So we got to really be listening so we don't miss the call. Amen? Listen, the Bible is all about the future and what's going to happen. When you start putting all these books together that we're studying right now, you get a pretty clear picture of what's going to happen. After the Spirit is poured out upon the sheep and after the Spirit is poured out upon faithful Israel, then there'll be a kingdom age upon earth uh, where the lion will lie down with the lamb and the baby will play with the poisonous snakes and not be hurt. And, and those are just things to kind of give you an idea that peace will reign upon this earth. Listen to me. There's never going to be peace on this earth, no matter what political system, no matter what country, there'll never be peace on this earth. Never has been, never will be, until Jesus comes back and sets up His kingdom on this earth, and then there'll be peace on this earth. And only then. And what's really sad is even when there's a thousand years of peace on the earth, when, even when there's a golden age of kingdom age promises on this earth, even when everybody on this earth, when there's no death or disease or anything on this earth, men are going to still turn against Jesus. And so we know that. See, a lot of people say, hey, if I could just see Jesus, I'd believe in Baloney. You wouldn't. If you want to accept Christ on faith, you want to accept Him on sight. Because for a thousand years, people are going to be able to see Jesus every day. And at the end of that period of time, most of the people on earth are going to rebel against Him at the battle of God and make God over in Revelation chapter 20. Most of them are going to follow Satan when he's released from the abyss and his temptation. And they're going to turn against Christ who has given them a thousand years of peace. So the just, speaking from Habakkuk, as we'll study in a couple of weeks, the just shall live by faith. Let's all say that together. The just shall live by by faith. You say, Brother Don, it's hard to imagine us just getting caught up to heaven. The just shall live by faith. It's hard to imagine all of these things coming about. The just shall live by faith. Faith in what? Faith in the truth of God. Where is the truth of God? It's in the Word of God. These things will come about, for sure. Nothing can stop them. Man is not in control. Man thinks he's in control. But man is basically has zero control over what's going to be happening on this earth. There are spiritual forces at war. God is in charge. And what God says is going to happen, why is He giving us all this information? So that we will be prepared. Boy Scout motto, be prepared. Father, I thank You for this day. I thank You for all the saints that are gathered, gathered here today that worship you, to praise you, to hear from your word. I thank you, Lord, for your encouraging word this morning. Lord, we accept you. We accept your salvation. We accept your resurrection. We accept all the things that you have promised us in the New Testament. We accept all these prophecies that you've given us in the Old Testament. We receive them by faith. But Lord, strengthen our faith. Help us to really hang on to these things and really, really down deep in our spirit understand that they are going to happen. And then, Lord, transform us with that faith so that we live lives ready for your return. Ready for the day that we come face to face with you. Please help us do that, Lord. I desperately pray for that. I desperately desire that. And I think the congregation does too. So I pray for them in that too. We love you, Jesus. And we praise your holy name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's all stand up.